In this week's update, markets remain in risk on mode. It's a dangerous time, but a ex very exciting time, and the imperative to modify your approach. Hi, my name's Gary Davis, and as always, this is general advice only. And remember to subscribe and like the video. I just want to start with an overall perspective just to set the scene, and I think that's important to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page here. Um, so I'll do this most weeks. So not a lot has changed in the last week, um, but a few things have become perhaps a little bit clearer. There is a real battle going on in the markets between the plunging GDPs, which are occurring absolutely everywhere around the world, and the tsunami of money which governments and central banks are throwing at this global lockdown and the, uh, and the backwash of that. It's impossible to know how that battle is going to play out. At the moment, um, the tsunami of money is winning. Markets are looking forward. And, um, and a lot of that money is finding its way in, into the market. And so it seems illogical that the market is going up as it is. Um, but it's reality because markets are looking forward. And then on top of that, we've got this new disruptive battleground emerging between China um, and America. And specifically, the US has just uh, basically passed a law in the Senate with, um, with almost unanimous support. So this is a very bipartisan uh, piece of legislation, um, which is going to make it difficult for the Chinese to gain access to US capital markets. Now, obviously, that's very, very important for the Chinese in their aspirations to have um, access to the world's uh, deepest and most liquid capital markets. And the Americans are using that as a tool in their fight against, um, against the Chinese. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. And we saw a little bit of the backwash of it in the last couple of days of the week when um, even stocks as, as big and global dominating as, uh, as Alibaba and Tencent were, uh, were hit fairly hard because um, obviously they've got listings in the States as well. And the essence of this legislation is going to be uh, twofold, as I understand it. One is, unless companies, Chinese companies are far more transparent in terms of making their books open and available for audit, then they're going to be delisted. And uh, the second uh, aspect is that um, the, uh, the companies themselves are, um, are going to be uh, subject just to a, a greater level of, of scrutiny. So it's a very uh, fascinating battle that's going to be unfolding there. So markets are looking forward. The tsunami is winning at this point in time, whether the reality of the, the plunge in GDP uh, comes home to, to roost remains to be seen. Uh, but the bias, as I discussed last week, remains unquestionably bullish. The aggressive sectors are leading, uh, and we've seen you know, technology and healthcare and a lot of those sort of sectors that have led the way for some time. Uh, and we're also seeing consumer discretionary stocks are outperforming uh, consumer staples. So that's another, um, just another tick in the box for uh, the risk on mode. There are just simply powerful breakouts and trends absolutely everywhere. Um, you know, it's not just in a few isolated places, and it's not just with some major stocks like the FANG stocks, for instance. This is, um, uh, this is far more widespread than that. I just want to raise the question, and I dealt a lot with this in Portfolio Analyst uh, during last week, um, which I think if you're interested in doing your own analysis, I think is, is a bit of a must watch because um, I, you know, I really went into technical analysis to, um, to a degree that I don't think many people would have seen before. So I just pose this question for, for uh, people to think about. What do you use to make decisions? How do you choose stocks? And how do you choose when to be heavily exposed to the market and when not to be? Is it the media and consensus thinking? And if that's the case, then you're probably in a lot of trouble. So you, you need to find a different way to go about it. Is it fundamentals or is it technicals or is it a combination of both? If it's technicals that you use, then which indicators do you use? And again, this throws back to a question that I got last week for portfolio analysts, which was about using just this, you know, the stock standard garden variety kind of indicators 
that um, that you read about in most places. If you want to do a Google search and to teach yourself how to be a, a technical chartist online, then these are the sorts of things like moving average crossovers and trend lines that you're going to strike. But look, frankly, they're second order or third order factors in terms of really being able to understand uh, where markets are likely to be going. Those sort of indicators tell you where markets have been, but they don't give you very much in terms of where markets are going. And I don't think many people have really gelled or stopped to think about the fact that all indicators, no matter what they are, are simply derived from price and volume. That's it. There's two data points only. It's price and it's volume and there's really nothing else and everything else derives from that. So the essence of what I covered last week is that why not go to the source? You know, just go to price and volume and learn how to interpret price and volume in a way that gives you much greater insight into the future rather than just relying on an indicator which is merely a reflection of what has been. Most indicators are lagging indicators. They're not they're not forward-looking indicators. To get a, f a sense of forward-looking, you need to interpret price and volume, and that's a completely different ball game to what most people have been exposed to. And the concern that I have with just using the traditional indicator approach is that you end up with an answer, and then we think, well, that answer's got to be valid. But in many cases, it's it's not only misleading, it can be absolutely worthless. It can be pointing you in the in the wrong direction. So if you are going to use technical analysis, you need to make sure that you're using it properly because otherwise it's really a wasted effort. Now I covered this last week, but I thought it's it's certainly valuable enough perspective just to touch on again. So where should you be looking? Well, you should be looking at sectors that have got enduring growth for the next three to five years. Uh, to my mind, there's just absolutely no substitute for doing that. There's no point in owning, in owning um, good companies in sectors that have got headwinds. Uh, companies with strong balance sheets and cash flows, obviously uh, a must at the moment. <coughs> I beg your pardon. Um, technical outperformance is just such a critical factor at the moment because we've got effectively a bull market and a bear market within one. We've got some stocks doing outrageously well, scarily well. And we've got other stocks that are clearly in a bear market. Uh, so it's a case of the strong are just going to keep getting stronger. How do we go about it? We buy mild weakness in the strongest groups. It's it's really, it, it's not a simple process, but it is as simple as that in, in overview. And as I said before, you need to learn to interpret price action from the source data. Um, it's going to give you a far more meaningful and profitable answer than just relying on um, on certain indicators. The concept of relative strength is incredibly important. You can use that to great advantage. I think if you know if you did nothing else but use the concept of relative strength to guide your buying and selling, uh, I think you'd be streets ahead of where you are at the moment. And the other important thing is that the self-interest of major players is what drives markets. We, we see it, it manifests itself in all sorts of different ways, but at the end of the day, that's it. Self-interest of major players is what drives market prices. And there are a whole lot of things going on in the market which most people won't have ever had exposure to that are driving short-term price movements. And we saw that last week with options expiry in the US, which happens on the third week of every month. And it creates a certain dynamic. So the self-interest of the major players creates certain dynamics that are short-term. Now, once you understand that, you can look at some of those short-term price actions and largely ignore them because they're really just, they are just that. They're short-term, they're random, and they're going to reverse very, very quickly. So the more that you can understand about the real dynamics of what's driving prices in the market, the more that you can anticipate the likely future direction. So very, very important. Let's move on to American stocks. The S&P was up 3.2%. Uh, the NASDAQ lagged slightly, uh, but it's been leading for quite a period of time. 
the simple fact are, is that trends are up, sentiment is bullish. Um, at the index level, momentum is waning a little bit, as we'll see on the chart. Um, the, the candle range has got a bit smaller towards the end of the week. There was less emphatic closes near the top. Um, but because I've been at pains to, to explain in recent weeks, if you're looking at the market at the index level, then it's giving you some information, but that information is fairly limited in value. I have never seen a market that is as separated as it is at the moment between the winners and the losers. It's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. Keep a focus on the big outperformers uh, because they're not resting. They're still charging ahead. And I'm going to show you uh, some charts of just a couple. Not They're not recommendations, but just to illustrate the point. Now, the US dollar was uh, slightly lower. So it was just over 100 last week, just dipped under 100 to finish the week. And the 10-year yield, uh, yet again, was pretty much rock steady in the, in the mid 0.6% uh, area. All right, let's look at some charts. So I'll just start first of all with uh, just a look at part of the market. So this is XLY, this is the US consumer discretionary sector. Now the bottom pane is the one that I want to point to, which is showing the relative comparison with the S&P. So you can see that consumer discretionary was on the way down before the crash. It obviously got affected in the crash, which is what you'd expect. Money went into some of the, um, the more defensive sectors of the market. But look at how it's roared back relative to the S&P. So it's roared back in absolute terms, and it's now not that far from its all-time highs, but it's absolutely killing the S&P. So the reality of what drives the market, again, let's come back to self-interest. The self-interest of fund managers, they cannot afford to not be in the sectors that are outperforming the S&P. Otherwise, their clients take their money away from them. So self-interest you know, pretty much trumps everything else to my way of thinking. So that's XLY. Let's look at XLP, which is the defensives. So the, this is the Woolworths and the, and the Coles of, uh, of the US market. Look at the performance relative to the S&P since the crash. The performance went up during the crash, which is what you'd expect. But look at what's happened since then. Consumer staples are significantly underperforming. Let's look at the ratio between the two. There's been a long-term uptrend. So this is going back to 2008. So from 2008 for the next 12 years, the long-term trend is that consumer discretionary stocks are doing better than consumer staples, which is what you would expect in a bull market. But look at just the last few weeks. It's just been meteoric the way that consumer discretionary stocks have outperformed. So that's where you need to be. If you're looking to buy defensives, then you're just playing the wrong game. Let's look at a few individual stocks. This is NVIDIA. Now, fundamental analysis would argue whether this stock is overvalued or not. But the reality is it's been in uptrend for quite some time since the middle of last year. Yes, we had a reaction that uh, during the crash that took the price down from 311 to about 200. But I want to point to a couple of panes down the bottom, which is in really important. So the third one, second from the bottom, is the relative strength compared to the, to the S&P. Look at the relative outperformance even during the crash. Stocks like NVIDIA actually did better than the S&P because, oh sorry, they did as well as the S&P, so they didn't do worse despite the fact that they're in technology and, and technology had gone a long way. So they performed in line with the S&P and then as soon as the crash was finished, they're out back to outperformance again. And then the, the very bottom pane is uh, accumulation distribution, which is really showing on a day-to-day -day basis whether stocks are being accumulated by the institutions intraday. And if you look during the crash, the price went down, but the accumulation line uh, basically did not. We had a couple of dips, but basically it continued its uptrend, which is showing that institutions are buying these stocks during the day. The prices quite often, even though you might get a gap down, the prices quite often will close 
higher than where they opened and that's what determines the, the shape of this line. So just look at the strength that we're at new all-time highs. Let's look at another one called Slack Technologies. Now not as, uh, not as robust an uptrend as with NVIDIA but this is a company that very much benefits from the, the working remotely theme and we've now just had a breakout. We've got our performance against the S&P, we've got accumulation happening by the major players, it is now highly likely that this stock will continue to work to the upside. Now again, that's not a recommendation and it's not a guarantee, but I'm just pointing to the way that you can use technical analysis in a far more insightful, far more predictive manner by interpreting the source data, which is price and volume. Okay, let's move on. Aussie stocks, Aussie dollar moved a bit higher, 65.3. We seem to have found a bit of a ceiling there around the 60, 64 to 66 area. Iron ore remains quite strong. It's back over $100 a tonne, which is helping the Australian dollar. Our index rose 1.7% um, on the week. And it's really still the, the drag of the banks and energy in particular and, and a lot of old world industrial stocks that is holding our index back compared to the US. And we also have here a market in halves. We've got a bull market and we've got a bear market um, very much alive and well. Uh, I won't spend too much time on the Australian market because there's not, frankly, a lot to see there. There's the ASX 200. <coughs> Pardon. Um, as you can see, we've, we're still lingering around the 38.2. So we've only been able to rebound slightly over a third of the ground lost during the crash. Whereas if you look at the US market, it's up to two thirds. So the US market in relative terms is up here. The NASDAQ is up here and we're down here and it's largely because our banks uh, form just a, a significant part. I think it's about 22% of, uh, of our index and they're, um, they're not doing well and I can't see that they're going to any way that they're going to outperform the rest of the Australian market. In fact, I think they're going to underperform significantly. Um, and if there's anyone out there that, uh, and I'm sure there are plenty, uh, that are still very much wedded to the banks and dividend yields and are still convinced that that's the place for your long-term money, then um, I covered this in great detail in uh, Portfolio Analyst last week. Um, you, you might want to spend a dollar, take the two-week trial and, and just go and look at that part where I talk about why the banks did so well for a decade and why it's highly likely, in fact almost certain, that they're not going to do well for quite some period of time to come and what your alternative is. That's the important thing. You know, where can you get a, uh, a good return? Turning to precious metals, gold fell $7, um, so not a lot of change there. It's just doing a little bit of a uh, consolidation. The silver-gold ratio continues to mean revert. It just got ridiculous during the crash, um, and now it's working its way back to some sort of normality, but still got quite a way to go yet. Precious metal stocks, GDXE is back towards the end of the week. It was strong in the early part um, and, and gave back all of that towards the end. But importantly, stocks are outperforming the metal, and that's what we want to see. It's not a sustainable market when... Um, when gold stocks are not outperforming the metal. And um, up until about a year ago, so let's say the two to three years preceding uh, the middle of 2019, that was the thing that I kept pointing to If for anyone that's been watching these videos for some time. I was always concerned, you know, we'd have a bit of a burst in gold and gold stocks would go up, but they weren't going up faster than gold was. And so I always pointed to that, that it concerned me that we weren't ready yet. Well, I think we're now seeing that outperformance from, uh, from gold stocks, and I hope it continues. So the trends remain very strong there, and they're still pointing higher. So let's have a quick look. There is um, gold on a weekly chart. So there's the big picture. We've broken through all of the Fibonacci retracement levels. We've got resistance now coming up at 1795, let's call it 1800, and then the next level above that is 1900. All, all I'm um, 
pointing to here is that if this trend continues, that we're going to be at all-time highs. Now, this is not a prediction that we're going to get there, but all we need to do is to see this trend channel, which has been running now since November of 2018, so we're talking 18 months. All we need for that to do is to continue until the end of this year and we'll be back knocking on the door of 1900. It needs to do nothing else other than sustain that trend. Looked at on a daily, you can see the bit of consolidation that we saw towards the end of the week, but we do have a, a bit of a breakout there. And silver, of course, had a very good week. And you can see just how much more robust uh, silver has been. And uh, no, that's not the right spread. I might find the, that silver ratio gold spread uh, later on. Let's just have a quick look at GDX. So there's GDX on a weekly chart. The base started forming in the middle of 2013, so a seven-year base. We've now broken out of that base. We're outperforming the S&P, as you can see down here. So I can tell you that the overwhelming odds are that GDX will continue on now. There is no resistance until we get into the mid-50s. GDX is currently at 35. Um, that's an overall ETF that covers about 50 of the world's largest gold stocks. Uh, if you go to individual stocks, then you'll get much better performance. So I can see certainly GDX, um, the potential for it to double from here. Uh, and of course, some stocks will do far, far better than that. So it is still a very, very positive area of the market. Turning to other commodities, copper firms slightly, uh, crude oil also up more, but it's just coming back from crash lows. It's approaching an area of resistance, currently uh, in the mid-30s. Um, and energy stocks, I, I pointed to this a few weeks ago that you know perhaps uh, a trading play, not an investment, but a trading play would have been to go into some of the global majors like ExxonMobil or Woodside. But look, they've really failed to fire. They're not leading the way. And uh, it, you know, it's not a particularly good sign for the sector. And, and nor should it be, because the, the fundamentals around crude oil are, are not very attractive at the moment. So I wouldn't expect much from the energy group. Uh, inventories are falling. The US production uh, has obviously been cut in response to those oil prices and US production is, is now down to the lowest level that it's been in 18 months. So it's a pretty somber sector at the moment. And there's the spot copper chart. So wrapping it up, the world is changing dramatically and quickly. And I've been reading um, some uh, online material uh, from a very, very smart guy called Ray Dalio in the States who runs Bridgewater Associates, which is one of the biggest hedge funds in the world, and um, there's, he's done an enormous amount of research into the changing world order, and it really is fascinating stuff. We've got clearly elements of deglobalization happening, which is after decades of, of globalization and all the benefits that that brought, but also all the the negatives that that brought, particularly the wealth inequality. Um, the supply chain interruption that this um, uh, this virus, I think, is going to hasten. It was always going to happen. Um, supply chains were, were too reliant on China, so that change was always going to happen. Uh, but I think now we're we're going to see that as a as an imperative. We're seeing nationalism rising arising in a number of places, particularly in the U.S. Um, we're seeing a lot of bipartisan support for um, uh, for not closing the borders, but certainly taking a more uh, self-interested, nationalistic view of America than what we've seen for a very, very long period of time. And then, of course, we've also got modern monetary theory, which was bubbling away nicely, but the virus and the requirement to basically print as much as you need to has now hastened the acceptance of modern, modern monetary theory. Now, for some people, you might think, well, so what? I have no interest in any of that. Who cares? But the point is that these things do dramatically affect financial markets. So you don't necessarily need to understand what all these things are about and follow them, but you do need to understand the need to change your investment approach. 
because there is a new world order emerging rapidly. You know, if you look from the 1600s, the Spanish ruled the world, then the Dutch, then the British, then the Americans, and I'm talking rule the world both financially, militarily, technolog technologically, you know, in all sorts of ways, and it just repeats through the centuries. And now, of course, we've got China emerging and catching up to the US in all of those key areas and catching up rapidly. And this is all happening at the same time that technology is accelerating at absolutely light speed. Now, that's creating incredible opportunities, and that's why the markets are, in part, in technology and in healthcare, are rebounding so powerfully when you look at the, the consequences of the global lockdown and you'd be forgiven for scratching your head and saying, well, how can this be? How can markets be rebounding? And a lot of it is because of the, the opportunities that technology is creating. So my point, and this is the key point, if you try to invest like you always have, then you just, I'm sorry, you're going to get left behind. Now, if you've got so much money that it doesn't matter being left behind, well, fine, stay with what you're doing. But if you're not in that situation, which applies to most people, and you want to just continue doing what you're doing, you want to continue owning the banks, you want to continue just being concerned with a dividend yield, then I'm afraid you are going to get left behind. And I think, you know, again, this is another subject that I covered in Portfolio Analyst last week, uh, particularly around the banks. I think the hunt for yield, this, uh, this fixation with the hunt for yield and yield only, is so dangerous because it, it's causing people to go into stocks that are downright dangerous. So I pose the question, instead of the hunt for yield, why isn't there a hunt for total return? Yield plus capital gain. So if you go into stocks that are, that are in the right sectors, that are growing their earnings strongly and highly likely to continue growing their earnings strongly no matter what, and you... Um, and you may be only receiving a 2 or 3% dividend yield now, or maybe even no dividend yield now, but you put yourself in a position for that company to, uh, to produce a growing dividend yield, which on the prices you pay today could look amazing in three or four years' time, plus you get all the capital gain as well. So why aren't people looking at total return? If you need some income, then just sell a few shares. Why does the income stream have to come as a dividend yield at the sacrifice of capital gain? It makes no sense to me at all. So a bit of a hobby horse of mine, but anyway, we'll leave that one for another day. Portfolio analysts this week, it's really just working with the opportunities, and they're just everywhere. I've, I don't think I've ever had more um, uh, salivating opportunities than I'm seeing at the moment. It, it really is a, um, uh, a delicious smorgasbord at the moment. So I'm extremely positive about, uh, about the road ahead. For those who aren't members, there's, uh, you'll find more detail on our website. And also there's my email address if you um, wish to communicate with me directly. That's it for this week. Be back with you next Sunday. Cheers.